with pure righteousness also, back to that, I always thought it was interesting on adding on that you were talking and having to teach each of the stuff, but over like a house club type of beat. So what? how did that? That was totally 45 King's idea. <laughs> that it, was totally 45 King's idea. Anyway. And he was like, you're not going to say nothing to it? I was like, I'm not going to rhyme to that. He like just talk over it. I mean, my DJ just start building on it, on the on that song, just start going over you know principles that we live by, knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. But that was basically Mark's idea. You know, I'm glad, I'm kind of glad he did put the D Train house track on there because that garnered me a lot of house fame. Music is music, man. I grew up in Newark, so I grew up on what was called club music that grew to be titled as house music. Yet I was always familiar with house music, funk. I come from a very musical family. My mother always had all the new albums. As a child, I was always messing in her records. She would yell at me, don't break my records. I'm playing with my turntable and stuff. I always played my mother records. So once I got with 45 King and saw the way he was making them beats, I was a DJ, I was familiar with sound, so. Yet I wasn't familiar with a lot of them beats, though. So I had to learn them beats with, uh, I got familiar with a lot of beats from listening to Jerry Blood Rock on 105.9. Back in when I was in maybe the 10th grade, we would stay up at night. This is before Mr. Magic was on WBLS. He used to come on 105.9 FM, and they would come on late. They would come on at maybe 10, 11 o'clock at night. Mr. Magic would come on. This was like the only station you could hear rap on in the early 80s. This was before like BLS and your mainstream radio stations wasn't touching hip hop at that point. They would maybe play, they played Sugar Hill Gang when that came out, played Furious Five, the uh, Grandmaster Flash when they came out, but you didn't hear a lot of hip hop. Mr. Magic was on 105.9 back then. Anyway, when his, when his show went off, another uh, guy came on named Jerry Blood Rock. I think Jerry Blood Rock is a DJ from back in uh, the days, early hip hop. Yet uh, what Jerry Blood Rock did was just play break beats. Hmm. It would be no talking throughout his whole show. He would just play break beats. And he would cut them up. And he would play them for a while. And from listening to Jerry Blood Rock, we got familiar with a lot of old break beats. Also, when uh, another person would come on that same station called Africa Islam. he say his name is Africa Islam, the son of Bambada. He played a lot of the old funky break beats. He played a lot of, uh, a lot of old school parties with MCs rocking from Soul Sonic Force to Cosmic Force MCs, you name it. He played a lot of Zulu Nation anniversary parties and stuff on the radio. So we got familiar with a lot of that stuff. During the early 80s, you talking like from like 83, 84, 85, 86. Like 83, 84, 105.9, definitely. Mr. Magic, uh, Jerry Blood Rock, Africa Islam, Son of Bambada. Then you had Gods came out, the Supreme Team, definitely. And you had Awesome 2. Teddy Teddy, Hank Shockley. I had a few more people that was on 105.9. Those are the early years of hip hop. Yeah. And we were able to, when mainstream radio, like you know, they had hip hop playing. I didn't even win magic. You know, I mean, we don't need to hear hip hop. Like, you no, know, we had to see up. We had to wait all weekend to hear hip hop. It was getting real choppy there for a sec. What happened? I can't hear you. It was getting real choppy. You were cutting up. Oh, my bad. I'm sorry. I apologize. How is it now? It's okay? Yeah, now it's much better. But, okay, cool. Yeah, I was... I apologize about that. No, it's all good. Um, the other, Another thing, since there obviously is a lot of political and thoughtful music on the, on the debut, first in existence... Uh, I wanted you to talk about because, you know, you're talking about police or the beast, how you hate harassment. And that was 88 or 2021. And we're still dealing with these same. Same issues. elements, same things, man. So 
as somebody that was writing that in 88 and what you see going on now, like how, how does that affect you as a person? And, you know, what steps can you, can I, can we take to try to start turning the tide to being righteous, to doing the right things? Oh, well, the way that that affects me now, it just shows me that not a lot has changed in our society since then, far as with our relationships with the police. Uh, the, the, the best thing we can do is educate. That's what we could do. The best thing we can do is to build relationships with one another. You know, not every policeman is out to kill you. Not everyone hates the police. The policeman is there to do a job. We were taught as members of our nation to respect the governing men. You know, uh, the police job is to protect and serve. However, we see a lot of, um, because of the badge and the authoritative position and because of the gun, we see a lot of murder, a lot of death going on. And, you know, and it's, it is blatant in this day and time. It's not like it's hidden, it's, it's blatant. We're seeing murders right in on our eyes being captured on news, live newscasts right in front of you. This is what we've grown to in this society. So to answer your question, the best thing we can do is um, they say those who are closest to the problem is closest to the solution. So I'd say the best thing we can do as a people is strive to build relationships with the police. How do we do that? By communicating with them. Me and my brother had a conversation years ago. He said, no, we're going to do one day, God. I said, what? He said, we're going to go up in the, um, in the precinct, and they're going to look at us like what we want, and we're just going to let them know, no, we're just here to talk. I live in this community. Y'all police this community. I think it would be a lot better if we developed a relationship with one another. And that's the key to, to me, the key to mending relationships with the police is communication just like with any relationship if you have a, a tumultuous relationship with a woman i guarantee you research was going on there communication is communication yeah. communication is the key if we learn to communicate with one another on a rational and intelligent basis we can solve these differences it's all about communication i tell people a lot of the things that i've seen happening uh, with interaction with police can be avoided by simple cooperation. How about that? Communication, cooperation, remaining calm has gotten me out of all of every situation, every encounter I've ever had with the police. Because I remain calm. And I'm a rational thinker. I already have in mind that some of them have itchy fingers. I, I'm not blind. I see what goes on in the world. So why am I going to provoke them by talking to them in an aggressive manner? I see this happen all the time. My heart goes out to the young man that the lady shot who said she, you know, she reached for a taser, but it was a gun. I'm not going to even go into that. The point I'm making is this. They had the young man out the car, right? Why would you try to tug away from the police and jump back in the car? Why? A lot of these situations can be avoided. Is it justifiable? No. Should she have shot at him? I'm not a police officer. I'm not in that situation. You got to understand, this young man was out the car. They were in the process of detaining him. He pulls away and tries to jump back in his car. Is you crazy, young man? You don't see what's going on in the world? Why are you giving them a reason? A lot of times, people from provoke, uh, they pro uh, provoke the situation that they have with officers. I see it all the time. I say to myself, well, maybe if they didn't talk to the officer like that, the situation could have been avoided. I've been in that same situation. I was calm. <laughs> I'm going to remain calm and cooperative. Sometimes they do you too. I tell people, your chances of surviving an encounter with the police are greater if you're calm and you cooperate. And it's a proven statistic, man. I'm speaking from experience. You're talking about a black man here in America 
just like the rest of y'all that go through situations with the police. And I've learned that if you come and you cooperate, most of the time, they're going to let you go about your business. You know, you got to keep in mind they're human beings too. Man. We all human beings. Communication is the key. Yeah, but how I feel, it hurts me to see all of this death and destruction going on. I mean, we live in a very destructive world, man. I stay close to home. I'm a father. I'm a grandfather. I work hard. I'm all about educating the youth. I'm about teaching all human families of the planet Earth. That's my job, you know. Yet uh, when I see this death and destruction going on, my heart cries out. If you love humanity, if you love life, if you love the planet Earth that you live on, you like running water, you like jumping in a lake in the ocean sometimes, how could you not, you know, feel some type of hurt with what's going on in the world? The stuff that's going on to the planet, the things they doing in government, uh, the things we see on TV, the things we see, the interactions with the police and so on and so forth, you know. Yet at the end of the day, man, I trust in a greater source and power. And I know that that greater source and power is God and light of power and truth. I'm going to iron all of this out eventually. So, you know, I don't get caught up in what's going on in society. I stay aware of what's going on in society because if we're not aware, it's like you're walking around in blind faith. And because I do stay aware of what's going on, that keeps me grounded towards home and, you know, staying family grounded, hip hop grounded and away from trouble and nonsense. But yeah, man, uh, it's something, man. A lot of people told me, they say, bro, you were before your time. A lot of stuff you talked about on uh, No Justice, No Peace, Need Some Love. And a lot of your lyrics are relevant to what's going on now. And I say, yeah, man. They say we could predict our future. So there you have it. Yeah. You know, yeah, like 30 some odd years have passed and how much has changed? Well, technology has changed. We know change is something in life that's inevitable. And a lot of people don't never uh, learn how to adapt to the changes when it comes. Uh, as long as we can adapt, we'll be all right as a people. Yet I feel that love, communication, Remaining calm is the key. We can solve our differences with the police, with any group of people on the planet. I feel that any people on the planet can come together under a common cause of peace and right. We all just have to learn to communicate, coexist in peace and harmony with one another. What's so hard about that? You know? Yeah. Uh, you know, for some people, it's a hard thing to do. <laughs> just can't, like they used to say, well, we all can't just get along. Yeah, easier said than done, unfortunately. You know. Yeah. It's a well, very destructive day and time we live in. So I stay close to family, you know, stay close to my children. I'm a grandfather now. So the fact that I could see my granddaughter look up at me and grab the glasses on my face and grab my cheeks and stuff, and I see her smile. That means the world to me. That lets me know it's a brighter day ahead. Regardless to all this death and destruction I see going on in society, when I look in her eyes, I see the light of truth. I see power. I see a great future. I see the, the future builders when I look in her eyes, when I look in any child's eyes, because the children don't ask to come here. They're all innocent. And so when I hear about things happening with our children out here like child trafficking kidnapping and all of these different issues that people don't want to seem to shine a light on my heart really cries out because i have children and it doesn't matter uh ethnicity to me when it comes to people or children children are all innocent no child asks to come here and should not any child have to go through, you know, unnecessary torture, turmoil, and things of that nature.
Be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of gangster rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The history of gangster rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. I'm 19, I got a fifty thousand dollar car. My whole angle always was, I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. There will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that five on your TV back for that WA? Yo MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. It's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.